Hi, I'm Craig Smith, and this is Eye on AI. This week I speak to Stanford professor Fei-Fei Li, one of the people responsible for the current AI revolution with her creation of ImageNet, the world's first large labeled image data set which allowed the validation of neural networks. She talked about her early days running New Jersey dry cleaners to finance her Princeton education, her journey into artificial intelligence, and her latest work on ambient intelligence, which promises to transform elder care. I hope you find the conversation as informative as I did. I'm Fei Fei Li. I'm a professor at Stanford Computer Science Department and also the co-director of Stanford's Institute for Human-Centered AI. So I spend my day both doing lots of research with my students and also running this institute. I'm also very fortunate and, and proud that I co-founded the national nonprofit AI for All, which is a organization that's dedicated to improve human representation, diversity, and inclusion in AI by creating high school K-12 education opportunities to underrepresented and underserved population throughout the country, especially for racial, gender, socioeconomic class, and geographically underrepresented minorities. Tell us about how you got to Stanford. You came to the States as a little kid and went to school in New Jersey. And then after high school, what happened? Yeah, so I think I would call myself a typical immigrant story. My parents brought me to this country when I was in my early teens. So I was born in China, but my education, you know, that's very influential to who I am, started in a small public high school called Persephone High School in New Jersey. I entered as a freshman in the middle of the school year when I came to this country, speaking practically no English at all. And my parents didn't speak English, but they believed in this land of freedom and opportunity, and they brought me here. And so throughout my high school, my biggest memory is, you know how American high schools have these giant textbooks? I remember I have to carry not only the giant textbooks, but giant dictionaries <laughs> to learn this language. But we also worked very hard as a family of immigrants. I started by doing some house cleaning job and restaurant job, especially working back in the kitchen because my English was not good enough to interact with the customers yet. And eventually I was very lucky that I got into Princeton University. I was a passionate student for physics. And I think I was very lucky because one of my interviewer was a former physics major and he shared so much my passion. And I really believe he helped <laughs> me get into Princeton. So at Princeton, I majored in physics. Another parallel life to my college life was by the time I got into Princeton, my family and I realized even though I got a lot of scholarship and fellowship from Princeton, it's so expensive. So we borrowed money, especially from my high school math teacher in New Jersey, and opened a very tiny family dry cleaner shop. And I guess I was the de facto CEO since at that time I spoke English and my parents still didn't. And they still don't now. And... I employed my parents <laughs> and worked on the weekends. If you know anything about dry cleaning business, it's a weekend business. So I worked on the weekends back in Persephone at that little dry cleaner shop and then studied during the week. And I just have the best, most grateful memory of my Princeton education because it opened my eye to the field I really, really love, which is science. I, I knew since I was a kid, I love science. But I started reading about physicists and their lives. And I noticed some of the greatest physicists 
of 20th century, like Schrodinger, Einstein, Penrose, they started to be so intrigued by the science of life and intelligence, not just the science of universe and atoms. And that took me on a path in the middle of my college to be more interested in the question of intelligence and life rather than just pure hard atomic mechanical physics. So I had a couple of summer internships in various colleges that got me to dabble into neuroscience. And I did a senior thesis in the computer science department at Princeton, all kind of starting to pull me into the orbit of machine intelligence and human intelligence. And to be honest, at that time, it was AI winter. Nobody calls it artificial intelligence. So after I finished college, I became very, very lucky. I got into Caltech for PhD. I have to say I had a couple of other offers from MIT and Stanford, but Caltech was so beautiful and warm and had a program that allows me to do the interdisciplinary research in both computer vision and human cognitive neuroscience that I really fell in love with Caltech. So I went to Caltech for my PhD and had two PhD advisors. One was a famous German neuroscientist, Christoph Koch. Uh, one is a famous Italian AI professor, Pietro Perona. So I studied under both of them and began my career as an AI researcher in Caltech. In the meantime, I was running my family business remotely. My parents are still working back in New Jersey, Persephone, but my mom's health deteriorated so much that in the middle of my PhD time, I had to sell the dry cleaning shop and brought my parents to California. And since then, I've been taking care of my parents because of their health condition, which I will tell you later has a profound impact in my understanding of healthcare and aging population for, for COVID-19. But after Caltech, I think one of the most important thing to highlight is that for the outside world, the late 20th century and the first few years, first decade of 21st century in AI is a dormant period, what people call AI winter. But as a researcher, it was a vibrant period of ideas, especially the convergence of machine learning techniques, including neural network, the explosion of data and internet technology, and also the decades of discoveries and breakthroughs in cognitive neuroscience start to converge and give us important North Star questions in AI. And I was very lucky I was in a lab or in two labs that was really focusing on one of the most important North Star question of AI, which is the ability that humans have to perceive the complex world of objects and be able to name and recognize tens and thousands of objects in our rich visual world. And my advisors got me really interested in this question. And that was the beginning of my dissertation. And I was also the first generation, I would say, or one of the very early generation uh, PhD students who learned the new tool of machine learning, which was a budding sister field to computer vision where statistical models combined with the power of computing start to show its effectiveness in rethinking about these big AI problems. So we use techniques like neural network, like base net graphical models, you know, modern inference techniques, SVM and all that. So after Caltech, I accepted a faculty job at University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign. It was my first faculty job and got me to know the middle of America better as an immigrant who have lived on the coast of our country. And I really appreciated that year of experience as a young professor. But again, very luckily, Princeton gave me a call during my first year as a assistant professor and said, 
we're looking for a new assistant professor in computer science department who studies AI. And when your alma mater calls, you take the call, right? <laughs> I was very, very grateful. And I went to Princeton for a couple of visits. But one of those visits was very fateful for starting ImageNet. It was a serendipitous conversation I had with a linguist who was very kind to just offer to interview me or recruit me, you know, in that process of offering me a job at Princeton. And she heard I was very interested in cracking a holy grail problem of computer vision, which is object recognition. It's the process of naming objects like cats, dogs, chairs, microwaves, cars, trees, and all that. And then she said, have you heard of a linguistic project called WordNet? And I have never heard of WordNet before. But with a little bit of research, you realize WordNet was one of the most profound, important linguistics and natural language project that emerged out of Princeton in the 1990s that reorganized the entire English lexicon in a taxonomy that is different from typical dictionaries. The lexicons are organized by their relationship, such as what we call the is a relationship. A German shepherd would be related to a dog, would be related to an animal. And that was a large scale project that really had profound influence on linguistics and computational linguistics. And this researcher mentioned to me that. Wouldn't that be nice if every node or every set of words like German shepherd or dog or tree in this tens of thousands of entry word net dictionary or taxonomy would just have a picture attached to it so that people who go to word net would know what a German shepherd look like or what a panda bear look like or you know what a microwave look like. And then she said she tried this project with a bunch of undergrads at Princeton, and they didn't go very far for a couple of reasons. One is it's not clear it's that useful for the linguistic research to have a picture that attached to the word. Second is that it's really hard. You know, the undergrads have to go through tens of thousands of entries and find the picture, so it just didn't work. But that conversation really. Was like a spark of light in the darkness. I've been struggling to try to make object recognition to work, and suddenly I was thinking, there's a role that data can play in a way that we never paid attention to. You know, we've paid so much attention to tuning the parameters of our models, but mathematically we always run into the problem of overfitting our model without enough data. And the lack of generalization. These are kind of jargon words in machine learning, but they point to the mathematical fact that models are hard to fit, and one needs lots of good data to drive the model. And that was an insight that wasn't prominent in the field yet. I realized maybe we should try something completely radically new. Instead of spending time to tweak the parameters, we should. Create a large database of pictures of many, many tens of thousands of different kind of objects, and drive the capacity of the models to a whole different state, and see how that goes for this important problem of object recognition. So I asked the linguistic researcher. I said, "Is anybody doing this project?" She said, "No." She said, "In fact, we had a name for it." And it's called ImageNet, but it's a terminated project. So I said, "Would you mind if I started, but in a completely different way for my computer vision research? But I really like the name. <laughs> Can I inherit the name ImageNet?" She said, "Oh, by all means, just take it." So that's really the beginning story of ImageNet. It was during my transition into Princeton. So I moved my small, tiny lab to Princeton in. 
and we began the ImageNet project. And the idea is that we'll take 22,000 nouns that are countable and concrete in the WordNet taxonomy. And these nouns all are conceptually visual. They're nouns that are not, such as love is harder to visualize, but nouns like chair is. So 22,000 nouns, we want to provide hundreds and thousands of pictures from all kinds of sources to drive the diversity and variability of each concept. So if you multiply those numbers together, we're looking at tens of millions of curated picture. And to do that, we had to download nearly a billion pictures from the internet. And the downloading process itself is a very interesting process in 2007. And then and find a way to curate it. And we struggled a lot because first we also went to the undergrads and tried to entice them to label. And that was just impossible, you know, to pay the hourly rate and then try to hope we can get undergrads to label a billion images. My PhD student then who was working with me did a back of envelope computation and said, I won't graduate for another 19 years if we did this. So we also tried other ways to get computers to label, but that was actually just philosophically the wrong way to do because we're trying to curate a benchmark and training data set to improve computers' ability. If we use anything that was based on the existing ability of computers, we would introduce a very uh, low quality, erroneous data set. So we have to go to humans. And then in early 2007, or maybe in the middle of 2007, another serendipitous conversation in the hallway changed everything. It was with a master's student who happened to came from Stanford and was at Princeton. And he said to me, have you heard of Amazon Mechanical Turk? And I said, I have never. He said, I heard there is Silicon Valley startup that didn't have enough people to label some data. I forgot what kind of data, some color or wine bottle tags, one of those things. I used this very new online worker service that Amazon had beta tested. And it's a global online worker market. And people just post jobs and people worldwide do the jobs. And I remember I was very busy teaching that day and I went home at night and logged into Amazon Mechanical Turk. That night I knew ImageNet would happen because I've never seen a platform of that many, now we call crowd workers that can contribute in a global scale. Fast forward, 2009, we rolled out ImageNet as a research paper in our community. By that time, we had almost 60,000 online workers from more than 150 countries working and contributed to this curation of ImageNet. And 2009, we rolled out ImageNet. In the meantime, we open sourced it to the research and education community. And we felt strongly that this is a path to our North Star, one of our North Star. And in order to create this path, and invite more researchers worldwide to participate in this, we had to make a challenge. We had to make an international challenge so that we can roll out a benchmarkable test to our researcher community. So 2010, we started what we call the ImageNet Challenge Benchmark, which invited worldwide research teams to come and work on the problem of object recognition and we would release the challenge result annually and have an international workshop to talk about the results. And 2010, 2011, there were slow progress, but the progress were not significant. And 2012, I remember the deadline for the challenge was in late summer because we wanted to announce this at an international workshop of our annual computer vision conference. It rotates around the world, but that year was Florence, Italy in, I think it's in September or October. So we need to process the results in late summer. I got a call from my graduate student at night and said, 
we've got a remarkable result. And we need to check if this is wrong because the error rate was just cutting half from last year. And they also made a comment that it's using an algorithm that we have known for 30 years. And we didn't realize this algorithm can be this powerful. It turned out to be the entry to 2012 ImageNet Challenge by Jeff Hinton and his students. And it was the winning entry of the ImageNet Challenge that year. A small story there. I think I was lucky to realize that was a historical moment. So I wasn't going to go to Florence, Italy that year to attend the conference because my child was very, very small. I was a nursing mom. But I realized it was so significant that moment. I bought a last minute ticket to Italy, squeezed in the middle seat. <laughs> I was cursing my middle seat the entire trip. I was in the air together back and forth for probably 40 hours. I was on the ground for less than 18 hours to just go there, announce the result, chair the workshop because it was just so significant, that result. And I remember. At that workshop, Jeff Hinton didn't come, but his student, Alex, came. And also Yang LeCun came, and a number of very prominent AI and computer vision researchers came, and there was palpable energy in the room. You know, researchers' energy is not everybody clapping, it's really thinking deeply about this result and debating, and some people even expressing skepticism and pointing out the potential pitfalls. So there was a lot of discussion. But in a couple of months, Jeff Hinton published this image net classification paper at NeurIPS. And that was the paper that we fast forward eight years later that got them the Turing Award. And that algorithm was the back propagation algorithm, is that right? Yes, it was a convolutional neural network using back propagation. It had a couple of modern tweaks, but I think one of the most important change to that very classic algorithm. One is definitely ImageNet and the data. The other one is GPU. It was the first time that they used two GPUs and got the model to learn on two GPU because the model is very, very high capacity. It has a huge number of parameters driven by large amount of data. Traditional CPUs just cannot handle that. So without the GPU and the parallel computing, we wouldn't have that result in 2012. So that started these massive labeled data sets that have been growing all over the world. And algorithms and models are becoming increasingly general in their ability to classify depending on the kind of model. It seems to me eventually all of that labeled data will flow together into this data sea. And as the models become increasingly able to generalize, they'll have this vast sea of encoded human knowledge, because that's really what it is. That's what label data is. It's encoding human knowledge. Do you see it that way, that there is a future where all of these labeled data sets will come together and that algorithms that can generalize will be able to draw on that massive data? Great question, Greg. It's already starting to happen. One of the latest exciting trends of AI research, especially in machine learning community, is meta-learning and transfer learning. And when it comes to these ideas of transfer learning, you can see that data from different domain or data from different sources can lend themselves to algorithms that can learn across data and aggregate the kind of what you call knowledge or information. So it's that kind of aggregation and transferring and meta-learning is all part of the ongoing research of the data, see you call it. I do want to call out that even without labels, there's knowledge in data. You know, human babies learn without labels in many scenarios. They learn by trial and error. They learn by rewards. They learn by, you know, curiosity. Some of my own ongoing research is in that area. So even the concept of do we really need label data 
is being challenged, and we're seeing a heterogeneous approach to learning with lots of data these days. And then moving into the COVID research, you mentioned in one of your talks that I saw that the need for COVID data repositories. And I had a conversation last week with the Radiological Society of North America, which has a project to aggregate data into a repository. Are there other projects like that, or is that going to be the principal project for North America? So RSNA, I think, is the organization you're referring to, right? So I'm definitely, I want to be very clear, I'm definitely not a doctor. And, you know, I feel still I'm a student in healthcare research. So I know that there are many, many efforts across medicine and healthcare in data collection and data aggregation. Of course, When it comes to a field like healthcare, we have to make it really clear that there is guardrails and regulatory guidelines when it comes to respect privacy, personal information, and so on. But in general, the researchers in the community of whether radiology or medicine or genomics are recognizing the importance of data. I know at Stanford, some of my colleagues are leading a project even called Medical ImageNet. So I think that was led by a bunch of radiologists, and I actually look forward to know what's the latest of their (laughs) progress. Can you talk a little bit about what Stanford is doing and the Human Centered AI Institute? But in particular, I'm interested in your work on elder care and the ambient intelligence systems that you envision. I'm surprised that doesn't exist yet because the sensors are certainly there and it seems that the AI is there. It seems to me that it's largely a regulatory and privacy issue. But can you talk about that? Yeah, sure. So as I said, elder care is a topic of personal passion because I spent my entire adult life taking care of my mom who has a severe chronic disease. So about eight years ago, the AI revolution had started to take an upward ramp. I was still AI lab director at Stanford. I was hearing a lot about self-driving car technology that was a convergence of good sensors, good algorithms, and the need for holistic understanding of the driving environment and human behavior in order to make cars drive safely and so on. So that really dawned on me that healthcare has a similar needs, that this is a complex environment of humans taking care of humans and humans needing care of humans. And our doctors are constantly working so hard. I have been in and out of every single hospital environment you can imagine, from surgery rooms to ICUs to emergency rooms. So I can see that from my personal experience. I felt really fortunate I met Professor Arnie Milstein, who is a leading professor and thinker in healthcare, how to improve the quality of healthcare delivery and also keeping the cost down. And he told me something I never thought of. It was shocking for me to hear. The medical world has a lot of guidelines of how to do healthcare delivery, how to do it safely, how to do it effectively from surgery rooms to ICU to so on. But medical errors occur so much every year that tens of thousands of patients, some even put it hundreds of thousands, die of medical errors. Even for a very related COVID topic, hospital-acquired infection, mostly through malpractice or forgetfulness of hand hygiene practice of clinicians, kills about 90,000 patients in American hospitals per year. That's three times as many people who die from car accidents. And having heard that, Arnie and I felt if AI can become assistive in our healthcare system to help our clinicians and patients, And one of the population we identified is one of the most vulnerable population in the healthcare system is our aging population. Our aging population tend to have chronic disease. More and more, they are lonely and lack care and lack continuous care. 
and to put it positively, I want my parents, myself, you want your parents, yourself to live as independently as possible for as long as we can. So then we start really paying attention to this, and we identified some concrete research project that we have begun piloting. One is about understanding the daily activity patterns of a senior living alone, especially if the senior has some chronic disease situation, and hope to catch early patterns. Of medically relevant information, such as early patterns of dementia, sleep disorder, social isolation, which will sometimes get people to go to depression, you know, nutrition intake, and all that. And this is a scenario where it is very hard to have a long-term human to provide that information in a continuous way. But sensors that can protect privacy of our seniors. For example, depth sensors or thermal sensors can become a useful tool. So we begin piloting this. One thing I think it's really important to mention, as a researcher or also as our research goes, is the importance of research ethics and respect to privacy, fairness, and these issues. So our team works with bioethicists and legal scholars at Stanford every step of the way from the. Beginning of the design, as well as stakeholders like patients and patient families, to make sure we are respecting regulatory guideline, but also even a step further, thinking about the ethical and unintended consequences. So this has already been going on for several years, but then COVID nineteen hit the world, and to my dismay, we start to hear that the aging population. Is the most hit, and till today there isn't enough research to tell us why. But some of the hypotheses is they are already vulnerable because of the suppressed immune system. They tend to have chronic preconditions, and they tend to lack care and all that. So this really just solidified or increased my passion in. AI and healthcare research, especially for the aging population, because the same technology we have been developing to try to help doctors to monitor daily activity can be easily transferred to looking at hand hygiene practice, early signs of infection, and these related issues. So that's what the gist of this is. Yeah, beyond the privacy challenge. Is the challenge in synthesizing the data or fusing the data from all these sensors into a single model, or has that been done? Because you talk about studies with different kinds of sensors. Actually, it's not totally done. This is an ongoing research challenge. Human behaviors are incredibly hard for AI algorithms. Just take hand hygiene as an example, right? So capturing the right moment of hand hygiene, the right Behaviors of hand hygiene it is nuanced human behavior. This is, from a technical point of view, a lot harder than labeling a chair or microwave or a cat in an image, or talking about a dynamic scene, or talking about humans moving. We're talking about potential blocking and occlusion of you know from objects to humans themselves. We're talking about body parts that are very articulated. And it's harder to really track and catch. So, from a technical point of view, these are all challenging computer vision problems that excites us as technologists that we can work on them. Certainly, there's application in hospitals. What interests me, because I also am involved in the care of an elderly person, would be having a home system. How close is the research to fielding a system? That may not be perfect, but at least would alert someone that they need to check a video feed or that sort of thing. That's a great question, Craig. I want to see it being deployed and helping people as fast as possible. But I really want to emphasize that we have to be thoughtful, right? So the technology, I don't think it's impossible at all from a pure technical point of view. You know, this is definitely not like trying to put humans on Mars. It's not that far at all. You know, you can see it from self-driving car technology as well. But I think we 
have to spend time to figure out all the right guardrails, to figure out the right conditions of deployment, to how to protect people, how to think about the unintended consequences. So we have to work with you know the industry, with policymakers, with regulatory agencies. So from that point of view, it's harder to predict. But I do hope there is a collective will and goodwill that technology can potentially make a positive impact here, but we have to work with these multi-stakeholders to get it to the right place. There is a COVID application, as you pointed out, that this ambient intelligence tied to sensors could be used for early detection in the elderly. Can you talk about some of the other COVID-related projects? Yeah, so HAI is a year plus old. It's a young organization compared to many institutes at Stanford. But it's a very vibrant community. We already have 250 plus faculty. And the founding mission we have is indeed to advance AI research, education, policy, and outreach to better human conditions. So as soon as COVID hit the world, especially the Western part of the world, the researchers start mobilizing themselves. I know Some of my colleagues are working on drug discovery that uses large data, genomics data, drug data through machine learning techniques. I know my colleagues are looking at vaccine discoveries. Some of them use techniques of machine learning and data science. I know that some colleagues are thinking about the impact of COVID to future of work, to employment labor market and they use machine learning techniques to do the kind of modeling and predictions. I know that some colleagues are thinking about information transmission, misinformation, especially in the social media and media world, and they're using natural language processing tools and AI techniques to understand these phenomena. So I remembered in February, which is very early in the cycle of COVID, HAI was preparing for April 1st annual conference to talk about basic science of machine learning. But quickly, our leadership decided COVID is much more timely. So we pivoted within four weeks and ran a virtual conference on COVID and AI that bring together not only Stanford scholars, but nationwide experts on, from drugs to contact tracing to other issues to talk about COVID. So it's still ongoing work. I'm very interested in AI for all. Do you have some metrics of how that outreach is going, what are the channels that you're using, and what are the programs that you have going with that? So AI for All started in 2014 by me and my former PhD student, Olga Rusakovsky, who is now a Princeton professor in AI, and Dr. Rick Sommer, who is a director of Stanford's pre-collegiate studies. So three of us came together, and I think the website captures what we believe in. It says, AI will change the world. Who will change AI? I was waking up to a reality that really bothered me in 2014, which is that this powerful technology, you know, two years after ImageNet Challenge breakthrough, this powerful technology is on a fast track to impact the society, yet we have so narrow a human representation in developing this technology. And without that wide, diverse human representation, we cannot ensure that this technology will represent the kind of universal human values that we care about. So I really wanted to mobilize the diverse next generation of students to participate and learn about AI. So Olga, Rick, and I started for two years, a pilot program at Stanford as a summer camp for ninth graders from local high schools, predominantly young women of all backgrounds, and really want to show them what AI is and also show them that you have an important role to play in AI, your value, what you care about, whether it's healthcare or misinformation or art or you know self-driving car. 
there is a role you can play. And that became very successful. So 2017, we established the national nonprofit given the seed grants from Melinda Gates and Jensen and Lori Huang Foundation. And that year, we expanded to two programs with Berkeley. Berkeley was specifically marketing the program for diversity and low-income students in Eastern Bay Area. And then fast forward in this year, even though we're impacted by COVID, we're going to have 11 summer camps throughout the country inviting high school students from racial, gender, different economic uh, backgrounds, especially low-income families and rural areas to participate in AI. My dream would be every state in our country would have a chapter of AI for All summer camp. We also started a new program for online curriculum so that students from high school and middle school and teachers can get an early exposure to AI and some of them can go into the camps when they are a little older. And we also, for every student who has engaged with AI for All, we want to help them throughout their early career. So we have internship matching programs and alumni support programs to make sure that these students who today they look around, they're still one of the few in their class that look different from everybody else. We want to make sure that throughout the years, we provide opportunities and mentorship and friendship to them. So that's what AI for All is about in a nutshell. Yeah, it's very important. The current instability in the United States really boils down to education on both sides. Especially as a woman of color in this country, I benefited so much from education and opportunities that really, truly, I believe in it passionately. And it's also my way of giving back. <music> That's it for this week's podcast. I want to thank Fei Fei for her time. If you want to learn more about Fei Fei's work, you can find a transcript of this episode on our website, I on AI. That's E Y E hyphen O N dot A I. We love to hear from listeners, so feel free to contact us with comments or suggestions. The singularity may not be near. But AI is about to change your world, so pay attention. <laughs>